While this girl was in a coma, she could experience everything. <gasps> Starting things off, we get a chance to admire the snow-coated scenery while Mia, our soon-to-be comatose friend, reflects on Beethoven's dedication to music, even when losing his hearing. Yep, he became a composer after that. That's like a YouTuber losing his sense of humor. Or having none to begin with. <laughs> anyway, Mia introduces her family. There's her father, Denny, a band member turned teacher, and her mother, Kat, a groupie turned travel agent. And at last, there's her little brother, Teddy, who wants coffee. Relatable. Kat shows us a newspaper headline about a local band. Turns out, they know the guy. Denny is excited for the band's next gig, while Mia looks quite somber. I wonder why. If you miss each other, it's okay to reach out. Oh, she got dumped. Ha. <laughs> they get ready to head out for school, but a radio broadcast announces it's a snow day. So, school's out forever! Heck yeah, my dudes. Kat calls into work, pretending to be sick, so she can spend the day with her family. Wholesome. Mia stares deep into the newspaper, and we're in a flashback. Yeah, prepare for a lot of those. Meet Adam, the guy in the newspaper and the frontman for an up-and-coming band in Portland. And there's Mia, playing her heart out on the cello, alone. Adam checks her out, wondering if she can work the skin flute half as well as she can play the cello. Then, Kim, Mia's friend, enters the room and drags her off to lunch. Oh my god, he's totally into you. They gossip, and... Kim is a stalker. Later, Adam makes his move on Mia, immediately sending her into a nervous frenzy. I see you like yo mama. Me too. Smooth. Then, Adam invites her to see a chalice perform live before Kim butts in. I'll see you guys later. Based. Better be nice to you. Don't worry. Mia kicks ass. Yep, same actress. Get you a girl who can do both. Back in the present, the family plans to take an impromptu trip to their grandparents' farm. Mia hesitates as she's waiting for the result of her Juilliard audition. Come on, we're not going to see you after college, and we'll let you pick the music in the car. Guilt and bribery are the glue that have held parents and teenagers together for generations. I think for most kids, it's belts and sandals, and occasionally your dad leaving for milk and never coming back. During the ride, Mia reflects on how she turned out, despite being the product of two punk rockers. And we're back in the past. We can see her dad playing on stage with his band, the... Nasty bruises. Embarrassing, I know. Kat attends a show while holding Mia. This shouldn't be legal. Fast forward a bit, and one day at school, Mia shows interest in playing the cello. And, since she has cool parents, they hire a teacher for her, but they're only able to afford renting the instrument. Mia becomes enamored with the cello and practices every day. I love her, but I'm about ready to stab my eyeballs out. Well, wouldn't it be more pragmatic to stab out your ears? One day, Denny sits outside Mia's room as she practices. Cam walks up, and Denny reflects on how Mia plays out of pure love for the music, unlike him, who picked up music to pick up girls. Relatable. One day, Denny bikes home with Mia's very own cello. Meanwhile, in the present and on the way to the farm, <laughs> tragedy has struck. However, Mia wakes up unscathed. Weird. She looks for her family and ends up finding her own body. Shock fills her as the paramedics report on her condition. Her body is lifted up and dragged off into an ambulance. She follows along, desperate for answers, before we cut back to the past. We see Mia nervously preparing for her first day with Adam. He arrives and immediately impresses Denny by knowing he was the lead singer of Nasty Bruises. They head out, and Adam remarks on how cool her parents are. So they tell me. At the live performance, Adam scores a win. Hand-holding. Let's go! You dirty dog. Outside, Adam points out how strange it is that she ended up as a shy classical music girl when her parents are rockers. Yeah, we've been over this. Let's move on. Mia inquires as to why of all girls, she chose him. Because I like to watch you play. You're so into it. And you're beautiful. Bingo. Right answer. Later, Adam invites Mia to one of his band shows. He sings away while locking eyes with her the entire time. Only try this if you're good looking. Oh. Backstage, Mia fails to fit in. Then, Adam gets invited to an after party. Wanna come? Not here, Adam. What? Oh, um, I, I mean, I have a curfew. Curfew? Did I stutter? Adam returns home, and Mia reveals she's a little jealous of Liz, Adam's bandmate. Now look, I see your concern. We do have a lot in common. We're both into girls. Feel dumb now, don't you? Adam goes in for a goodbye kiss, but then... Go, have fun! Wait, you don't have a curfew? Oh, um, you know, I'm feeling under the weather. Okay. Before Adam leaves, Kat invites him to dinner on Sunday. Once he's gone, Mia erupts. You know, that was wrong. She storms off, and Kat wonders why she's being this way. She shouldn't be scared of those guys. They're basically us. Exactly. In the present, Mia arrives at the hospital. She tries to ask for her family's whereabouts. However, Hi. she's a ghost. Her body is sent to the operating room and... If you live, if you die, it's all up to you. That's entirely false, but okay. Then, Mia sees her dad's body being sent to a different operating room and we flash back to Sunday dinner. Denny calls out to Mia with Adam in tow. She's happy to see him and her mother is proud. The day is going great as Adam effortlessly gets along with Mia's family and friends. Suddenly, Mia gets stung by a bee, and... Bravo. 
All right, you gotta return the favor later, just not on my hand. Whoa. Later that night, Mia receives a text message from Adam and goes out to her balcony. Surprise, he's here. Adam climbs up and shares he had a great day and admires Mia's family. He shares that his own family isn't intact and that he's used to being alone. You're not alone. Not anymore. Kill me already. Ha, <laughs> Mia's way ahead of me. Too soon, she gets tired of looking at her own organs and decides to look for her family. She notices Kim and sprints towards her, leading her to her grandparents who are talking to a social worker. Denny and Mia are being operated on and Teddy is unconscious but alive. Fitting back to Halloween, Mia asks for fashion advice from her mom. She wants to go as a cool rocker chick to fit in with Adam's crowd. Adam pulls up, rocking that 18th century drip. The pair meet up, head inside, and then Adam goes off to get the show started. Suddenly, a spooky skeleton appears. Want a bone? Ha, <laughs> good one. Come on, at least give me your bone number. This man is an intellectual and a scholar. After the show, Mia asks Adam if he likes her better as this rocker chick. The you you are now is the same you I was in love with yesterday, the same you I'll be in love with tomorrow. That line is sure to seal the deal. Can we go somewhere? Bingo. Adam takes her to an abandoned shed. Romantic. One day, this will become a spot for his band to rehearse and record, but for now, it'll be a place for them to hug tightly for about five minutes on average. Well, that's as good a time to cut as any. Mia's body is back from surgery and Nurse Davis is by her side. Another body arrives, but it isn't her dad's or her mom's. Mom was DOA, dad died on the table. Oh no. Mia is devastated. Memories of her parents flood in as she breaks down. Then, she sprints off to find Teddy, the last person she has left. Thank God, she finds him alive with her family friend Willow. Her grandparents enter the room and break the somber news. Everyone is shook. Mia runs off once more and notices Adam rushing to the hospital. She runs to her body in an attempt to wake herself up. Meanwhile, Adam tries to rush in, but... I see your visitations are restricted to immediate family. Come on, guys. She's running low on those. Back in the past, Adam's band has been playing more and getting recognized. He's even got record labels taking notice. And Mia's doing well herself, playing at a college festival despite still being in high school. But it's not all rainbows and sunshine. They're finding less and less time to be together as their paths diverge. Maybe we could get a place together. It actually sounds kind of perfect. After Mia's impressive performance, she chats with her family about going to Juilliard. It's the best there is. True as that may be, she remains hesitant. Afterwards, she picks her father's brain about why he gave up his music ambitions. You didn't have to give up something you love so much just for us. But I didn't, sweetheart. That adventure played its course, and then I started a new one with you guys. Sometimes you make choices, and sometimes those choices make you. The cello was a choice that made me. Yeah, that's what I'm saying, man. Apply already. Atta girl. Later, Mia asks Adam about the band's future plans, but she hesitates to tell him about Juilliard. At home, Mia practices for her application. Insecure, she takes a slight jab at punk music. This is serious music. I can't just fool around. You little sh**. Nonetheless, her family supports her through the grind. I thought the last one was amazing. Aw, oh, I'm gonna be so sad when you die. Nah, there's no way he doesn't make it. Anyway, Adam's band hits the road for more shows, but Mia stays put because of school. We cut to her and Kim having coffee before Mia gets a call from Adam. Babe, we were just offered a deal with a record label. The call ends prematurely without a proper goodbye, leaving Mia in shambles. God, I hate this. At home. Oh shit, a letter from Juilliard. Mia's invited to perform a live audition in San Francisco. We cut to Adam's band practicing for a show when Mia sneaks in to drop off some food. She scurries off, but Adam notices her. He catches up, and she reluctantly reveals that she applied to Juilliard and got an audition. Way to go, that's cool. Yeah, he's less than thrilled. Later, Mia attends his show and notes that he's really coming into his own as a performer. Hey, bomb Hey, man. A bomb hell of a nickname. Suddenly, milk truck arrive. She requests an autograph to which Adam giddily bestows upon her bosom. Meanwhile, a visibly irked Mia walks off. Afterwards, Adam and the gang are preparing to leave for a different show, but not before we commence with some arguing. This is about you ditching on our plans. You're a liar. Mia suggests they keep it long distance, but Adam counters. It's like dating a ghost. Boy, do I have news for you. Anyway, Adam storms off, upset that Mia won't, uh, completely ditch her dreams for him and his stupid rocker vibes. After their fight, a single day has passed and Mia is losing her shit. Ha, <laughs> just wait till you lose your whole family. <laughs> That's not funny. <laughs> On day two, Adam pops up in Mia's room. While she was away, he broke into her room and decorated her ceiling with a replica of Jalori Hall. So she won't be nervous during her audition. Adam tries to make peace. Mia flinches away. Two days, Adam. Two whole days. You can't do that to me. Adam explains that due to his family, he's used to being abandoned. Relatable. So, he got scared about losing her. Moving on, he presents her with a cello guitar bracelet as a birthday gift. In response, and there we go again. Okay, audition time. Now that the ceiling is a familiar sight, this will be a breeze. Mia plays her heart out as her grandpa watches. On the ride home, he commends her for her incredible performance. 
You know, I really regret not encouraging Denny about his music. I won't make that mistake again. What you did up there was magic. Then, Mia visits Adam and catches him practicing a new song. They talk about her audition and Mia confesses that she killed it. Adam still seems torn, but they both agree to celebrate. After asking Adam why he didn't write a song about her, Mia becomes indecisive about attending Juilliard. However, this time Adam is far more encouraging about her leaving. I mean, you'd do the same for me. I mean, I kind of already am. You're always gone because of your shows. You tell him, Mia. Back in the present, Ghost Mia follows Kim to the rooftop where Adam is. You know, I loved her from the moment I saw her playing cello, and now it's all gone. I'm such a dumb, stupid idiot. Then, in an act of pure stupid idiotness, Kim helps Adam distract the guard so he can go into Mia's room. We really need someone down there! Hey. Damn, she's really selling this. Adam approaches Mia's lifeless body when... Please, I just, I just want to feel you touch me. What the... Hands off! Come on! Adam gets dragged out and nearly kicked out, but runs into Willow who comes bearing more bad news. Mia panics and rushes to Teddy's room. He's gone. The doctor explains to her grandparents that Teddy had an epidural hemorrhage. Whatever that is. They did everything they could. Mia collapses with grief as it all sets in. God! A heavenly light appears as Mia's body begins to fail on her. She's rushed in for another surgery. <sighs> okay, let's get back to happy thoughts. Mia and Adam are celebrating New Year's. They once again reevaluate their future. Mia remains open to a long distance relationship, and Adam, well, that. She goes home, and upon being greeted by her family and friends, breaks down into tears. Kat comforts her as Mia reveals that it's over with Adam. You're supposed to break up with someone because you're not in love with them, not because you're completely in love with them. Okay. Kat advises her that there's no clear answer. Any decision she makes comes with a win and a loss. But as her mother, she'll support her no matter what. After the surgery, Mia's grandfather watches over her, finally letting his feelings out after thinking long and hard. He confesses that Denny quit the band to fully support her and Teddy. No surprise there. He quit the band and sold his drum kit to buy Mia's first cello. Her grandfather pleads with her to wake up and fight, but understands if she can't. I want you to know it's okay. Numerous people visit her, even lives with her girlfriend, but no sign of Adam yet. Then, Kim shows up and sits to talk with her best friend, encouraging her that she still has a family. She reminds me of her happiest day. We flash back to Labor Day, a time before her fight with Adam, a time when all her family and friends were together. At night, they decide to light up a bonfire and jam it out. Eventually, Denny and Adam bring down Mia's cello and encourage her to play. A nervous Mia declines. No way, I'm playing for you guys. Not for us. With us. She gives in, and it's not long before she's having the time of her life. Finally feeling like she's found her scene. Looking on from above is Ghost Mia, who can now time travel. Very cool. She zooms back to the future, or rather, the present, and walks around the hospital. She notices the beautiful scenery outside and prepares to embrace it. But then, she hears Beethoven busting in the background. She goes back to her room to find Adam playing her some music. Also, apparently, he broke into her house again and stole a letter. A letter from Juilliard. Mia, you got it. I... I'm gonna wake up now. But actually, he finally wrote her a song and it moved her soul, literally, back into her body. So, happy ending, sorta. Wow, we're almost at half a million subscribers. Thank you, and thank me.